bandwidth is just is just stretched um, to do that. But so I, I hope hopefully you could hear it and uh, kind of help you get an idea of what he's talking about. So let's think about it like this: Socrates and those uh, Plato they they created. It's interesting. I'm looking at my laptop. Normally, when you advance a slide. All right, here we go. That the uh, philosophers like uh, uh, Socrates and Plato, they created, they had these word games that they would play. And so, what is justice? And and so they they were like a fly, who that flew. And this is what how Liechtenstein actually illustrates it: like a fly that that flies into a jar and then can't get out. They 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 fly in through their own logic or their own arguments. They put themselves in these logical traps that they, they just can't get out of. And so he said, my job is to help them help get the fly out of the jar. And um, so um, he created systems which investigate the use of language, how we use language. And this really is the key for him. And what he saw, that the problem with the old approaches to philosophy was that it was how they were using language where they were talking themselves into a corner that they couldn't figure the way out of. And so he's going to propose a way to understand um, the world through the proper use of language in such a way that we don't find ourselves in these snares and these um, logical traps that we build for ourselves. And so he does this through two ways. One is the two main ways. One is the picture theory of meaning, which is in his first uh, publication, the uh, tract Tractatus, and then the other really develops in his second work, um, which was the uh, Philosophical Investigations. So you can see the time between those two. He, this one was published in 1921, and this was uh, 32 years later. That's and the thing was, this first one really caught fire. It really, after it got out there, it was really influencing people, and people were buying into it, and they were like, you know, there was like a sense of a paradigm shift for a lot of philosophers who felt like, you know, Ludwig had really helped them get out of the jar. And uh, But then he turned around with his later work, and he refutes some of his own work. Now think about that. If you write something in your 20s and then 30 years later, you've lived a lot of life. You've read books, you've experienced things. And so your writing is going to be different. And you may reflect upon your own earlier um, concepts and even say, you know what, I was wrong about that. And that's kind of what he did. The problem with that was the people who loved the first work kind of got irritated with him for changing his mind. So they were they were opposing the author of the work that they that they like. Well, the Tractatus Logica Philosophicus is uh, structurally is laid out pretty simple. And he, he numbers, he enumerates these points, these propositions. And uh, so the first one is, uh, the world is everything that is the case. And there, he writes in German, so depending on there are two main translations of his writings, and so they're, they're stated just a little bit different from one to the other. Um, the world is facts, I think is the way our book said that. The world is facts, and what are facts? Um, what is the case? The fact is the existence of atomic facts. Um, the logical picture of facts is the thought. The thought is the significant proposition Propositions are truth functions of elementary propositions. Uh, point six, very few people even tried to explain it. <laughs> so he really tries to, to break it down and provide this equation whereby you can plug in any of the variables in, in a, as you're dealing with a topic or a subject um, to, to kind of determine uh, if uh, what form of truth, if it's a truth function, um, if it's a logical truth or a factual truth, and uh, I'm not even going to try to, to break that down. Um, so, and then finally, he gets to the end, and this is kind of a famous phrase. If you study him, you're going to see this often. 
Whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. And some people think that applies to everything he had just written. <laughs> so after reading his whole work, 70 pages of it, and, and sludging through it, you get to the end of it and he says, whereof one cannot speak, one must be silent. So he, in fact, the book talks about some of his arguments become what you call self-defeating. Uh, when you can't understand metaphysical, uh, there's no such thing as a metaphysical reality. You can't understand it. You can't logically. It's nonsensical. And yet some of what he writes seems to fall into that area. And so he is undermining his own argument in a way. And a lot of people think he did that on purpose. So it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of odd. Well, let's um, think about it. The world is comprised of facts. Okay? Not objects facts. Remember Socrates said the, if you can list every object in the universe, <laughs> then that's the world. And uh, Victor Stein says uh, the objects in and of themselves don't tell you anything. It's how they relate to one another. And so a fact is a state of affairs. That's what he calls a state of affairs. A state of affairs is how objects relate to one another in the world. And so that can change, right? So an apple can be on a desk or an apple can be in the refrigerator. So you have the objects, but the world is not the object. The world is how these objects relate to one another. And that's where language comes in. And he says that was the trap of, uh, of Socrates when he talks about justice. Everybody's trying to give a definition of justice. And Socrates says, yeah, but is that all that justice is? And, you know, he goes on and on. And so... Um, Victor Stein says, essentially, if I was talking to Socrates and Socrates asked me what justice is, I would say a man who's been found innocent of a crime that he did not commit and all such like things <laughs> and everything like that. <laughs> so he, he thinks that that would be the answer for Socrates. Um, the totality of the world is irreducible to objects alone. So you cannot reduce the world only to the objects, to the apple. It's the, the apple is on the desk. The apple, an apple a day keeps the, the doctor away, you know. So these objects have meaning within a structure, within, a, um, within the fact, which a fact is a state of affairs. So within a state of affairs, you have meaning. And that's really what he's saying, is that objects alone really don't provide meaning or reality. It's how objects relate to one another, how how we understand what he calls states of affairs. And this is in the use of language. And um, so this is really what he's getting to here. Uh, four characteristics related to the state of affairs. So the state of affairs is how objects relate to one another. The state of affairs represents the facts. The facts are combinations of objects or things. And facts are either simple or complex. So. Let me just stop right there. I mean, we're just scratching the surface. Are you with me so far that the universe is not just a list of objects? He says the universe, the world, it is facts, and facts are how these objects relate to one another. And this, how objects relate to one another, is called a state of affairs. And by objects, he's not just talking about like an apple, but you can talk about uh, music. So music, if we think of uh, like a song we're all familiar with, Amazing Grace, we can think of the, the, the melody in our mind. It's not something that you could draw. You know, you can write the notes on a sheet of music. But he's talking about the picture. Like in our mind, we picture something, and then we state that. And by picturing it, it can be music. It can be a color. It can be um, uh, even perhaps... Um, something like love or justice or something like that. Although you have, he does not believe you can engage in metaphysical um, propositions. So facts are either simple or complex. And that's the book gives a very simple illustration. The cat on the mat is drinking the water. I think that's what they said. And so you take that all together, you can break that into two simple propositions. There's a cat on a mat and there's a cat drinking water and you put it together and it's more complex. And that complexity can grow when you talk about things like weather, 
you have, you know, uh, the wind and humidity. And so it's a combination of objects that create what we call weather. So they can get very complex, but you're still talking about a state of affairs, which are the facts, which is how we understand reality and the world. Um, facts are reducible to simple facts, atomic facts, the most simplest fact. So we're not getting back to the object, but we're talking about the most simple statement of relationship of one object to another. The cat, on the, the cat is on the mat. Um, and so a simple state of affairs can either entail or exclude any other simple state of affairs. Um, a state of affairs would be, for example, and then stating it negatively, would, would be a cat is not on the mat. So that's negatively. Positively, the cat is on the mat. That's a state of affairs. Negatively, the cat is not on the mat. You're stating something that is not, and yet that would include a state of affairs as well. Facts are either logically possible or logically impossible. Any fact or state of affairs may be true or false of the actual or any possible world. So we could think about something, you could talk about a state of affairs that might seem to be factually impossible, but logically possible. Uh, when I say factually, I shouldn't say factually. Um, could be impossible within the realm of reality, and yet, uh, so it's not happening. So if I say there's a cow in my room, and there's no cow in my room. But I can say that as a statement of fact, and, and we can conceive of that. We can picture that. So uh, that would be expressing a state of affairs, even though in actuality there's no cow in my room. And so he says you can state statements of fact like that, without them actually occurring at that moment because we can picture it because it's in our mind we could picture that state of affairs and uh, facts within the natural world can be understood to say something about what a thing is positive or negative which i already said a cow is not in my room a cow is in my room and uh, so he gets into this picture theory of meaning um, again i don't want to spend the whole time on him even though i spent a lot of hours studying the basic idea behind the, the theory of meaning is that a proposition is a literal picture or model of reality. Again, uh, when we talk about picture, we're not talking about a photograph. We're talking about something that we can picture. He uses the word picture, but again, if we think about a melody, it's not a picture of a melody. It would be remembering the sound that we heard. Um, but it's, he would use that to refer to a picture. It's a picture. Uh, in our mind of something that could exist through any arrangement of objects uh, in, in the world. And so then you have a state of affairs, which constitutes the facts, which if you take all the facts, that's what's in the world. This means that the constituents of language directly correspond to the constituents of reality or possible reality. Simple propositions correspond to simple names or signs of language, just as a simple states of affairs correspond to objects. The most simple state of affairs, a cat is on the mat. You have two objects, you have a cat. In relation, structurally, the cat is on the mat. And that, that would be a fact. And um, just as relations in a literal picture are understood via the special relations within the structure of the elements of the picture, so too in the logical picture, in the picture of your mind, you're going to be imagining objects in relation to one another. That creates the structure. So if you're looking at a photograph or if you're looking at the screen, you know, you say the words at the bottom, uh, the, the lowest paragraph is indented, the, the highest header is bold. These are in relation to one another, right? Or so it's a, it's a, a state of affairs, and the state of affairs pictured here, the lower paragraph is indented, the, the uh, heading is bold. And so we say, just like that in a picture in our mind, when we think about a state of affairs, we're thinking of objects in relation to one another. So if, you know, if you ask someone, you know, what justice is, you're going to think in terms of these pictures, uh, whatever it might be. It might be uh, in, in one context, this the person who's released because they did not commit a crime. But you could also picture someone who is arrested because they did commit a crime. 
If you were to ask about injustice, you would say someone who is released from prison even though, or, or was not found guilty, even though we know they committed the crime. That would be injustice. And you picture these things in your mind in relation to one another. And so these become the facts. And the facts, that's reality. So again, it's, you're not like Socrates, where you're just boiling it down, boiling it down, and then you have this, the word justice, and you don't know what to do with it. And you, you're, you know, you've, you've ensnared yourself in your own logic. He says, no, because it's not about the word justice. It's about how the word justice is used in relationship with other concepts. And that may be determined in any given context. So for the, 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 the prisoner in prison, how he, how he structures, how he takes the word concept and puts it together with other objects and his picture may be quite different from the victim of a crime. When they think of justice and how they take the word justice and they combine it to understand what justice is. So we have these facts, which are states of affairs, which are the combination of these objects, which we picture in our mind uh, and they can be true and logical. So every proposition, the proposition is the statement, is a, is a truth function on elementary propositions. So again, they become more and more complex as they as you expand the concepts or the picture grows larger in your mind, whatever it might be. Complex propositions are analyzable uh, by way of being broken down into simple propositions for, with the truth, for which the truth function within the more complex proposition can then be seen to relate. So you take a long a paragraph or whatever it might be uh, statement and then you, you break it down and you see how these things relate to one another and, and how one in the structure supports the other or explains the other and helps you to create a clear picture of reality. That's where the reality comes from. It's not from throwing out ex esoteric words or just coming up to somebody and saying, you know, bear. You know, if I were to walk up to you and say bear, yeah, <laughs> well, a bear is a real thing, right? But there's no reality connected to that word isolated from, from a combination of objects to communicate a proposition. So this is what he was saying. He was saying all these other philosophers, they kept breaking it down uh, to the most basic facts to the point that they became incomprehensible and illogical. When we talk about logic, logic is the proper use. The, the combination of propositions uh, or the combination of objects in a state of affairs which become the facts. Um, and here's what he says. There are four classes of propositions which Wittgenstein, I get it mixed up too, Wittgenstein labels nonsense. He says propositions of metaphysics. So if we're talking about all that is in the world, right, our facts, we get Outside of the world, we're in the metaphysical realm. It's outside of the world. Where that's beyond reality. We can't, to talk about God would be nonsense because God is, by definition, outside of the world. Now, we might think of him as being imminent, as being a part of it as well. But God stood outside of the world before it was created. And he said, you can't even talk about God. It's, meta it's beyond. You can't put it in a proposition. He's outside of it. Um, propositions of ethics, because ethics talk about what ought to be. And he says states of affairs are not about what ought to be, but what are or are not. There's a story of him. He, some people believe, actually, that he might have been bipolar. They didn't have that language back then. But uh, he never married. Some people feel like that he was probably homosexual, but that he never, there's no record that he ever engaged in homosexuality, but that he, he was not attracted to women. He was... Pr from some of his letters, it suggests he was attracted to, to men. But um, uh, he, he struggled with that. He never, like, again, he never practiced homosexuality, as far as we know. But that he was bipolar. And um, like Bertrand Russell said at Cambridge, uh, uh, Ludwig would show up at two in the morning and just start going on and on and talking. If you think about it, if you know anybody that's bipolar, when they're in that kind of that, that manic time or that manic phase, you know, they talk a lot and said he was animated and, and he would just carry on. And Bertrand Russell would say, 
are you talking about your soul or are you talking about philosophy? And Ludwig would say both. There's one story in terms of Ott. There's a philosopher of science. He, he's passed away I, uh, probably in the 80s. His name was Karl Popper. And uh, Karl Popper had, had met uh, Wittgenstein. And um, so Wittgenstein got very animated because Karl Popper believed in, in ethical statements of you ought to do this, you ought not to do that, you should do this. And that's, those are kind of ethical statements and what you should and should not do. And um, supposedly, in wherever they were, there was a fireplace there, and, and uh, Wittgenstein had a, a poker, like you use in the fireplace. And he had it in his hand, and he's so animated, and he's waving it around. And, and he says to Karl Popper, he says, tell me one thing that you ought not to do. And he said, Karl Popper said, you ought not be waving that poker around <laughs> in front of my face. Um but so in ethics, he said, you can't say what ought to be. You cannot predict the future. It's states of affairs. Um, he didn't think uh, you could get into propositions of religion and theology at all. He, those don't really represent states of affairs. In his opinion, that would represent more of your own feelings or your metaphysical conception of, of things that you cannot empirically prove. Although he was not necessarily an empiricist. Propositions even of philosophy, which again brings you back to this idea that he has a, his own self-defeating argument because he presumes to write something that's going to end all arguments and all discussion on philosophy. Um, <laughs> Wittgenstein therefore concedes that his work should be recognized to some extent as senseless. So you read through all this and he says, yeah, even this. It's interesting because some people believed he was an empiricist the way he writes uh, there was a group at, uh, at uh, I, think, I don't know if it was at Cambridge or where it was, but they were called the Vienna Circle. They loved his Tractatus because they felt like it supported what they were saying. They were empiricists. You can't prove anything that cannot be empirically proven. You can't empirically prove God, so there's no God. You can't empirically prove love. I don't know if they might even argue there's no love. Um, so, so they asked him to come and speak to them. They they loved his work and they want him to come and speak. They believed that they were, uh, you know, that they had common ideas of reality. And uh, they kept asking him to come and speak and he kept turning them down. So finally there was a conference and they asked him to come and speak to their group. And the, they said he went, he goes to Vienna to speak to the group. I'm not sure if it was in Vienna or, or um, Cambridge, but he goes to this group. And he gets up in front of him, and he has a book of poetry, and he turns his back on him and stands on the stage and reads poetry. That was his response. I think he was trying to say something to them uh, at that point. So this is his, um, uh, his work there. So what are the implications? The, the McGregor talks about this. Theology and ethics, according to Wittgenstein, should never be spoken because they cannot be defended. They're outside of the world. They're metaphysical. Um, they're not, you can't, you can't uh, state them as states of affairs in terms of objects in relation to one another. Same thing for all these rules. This rules out apologetics. You try to defend it, uh, your, your theology by using apologetics. He's saying you're not talking about states of affairs. You're describing something using metaphysical terminology, things outside of the world itself. Um, Atomic facts, when you boil it down to the most basic facts, he says you can't use these atomic facts to argue for the inspiration of the Bible because you're talking about states of affairs as they exist, not about what has been inspired. So he doesn't believe you could talk about inspiration of Scripture and certainly not of inerrancy. He says that biblical inerrancy, uh, well, he doesn't say the McGregor is inferring this from Wittgenstein's writings, uh, biblical inerrancy can only be demonstrated by showing that each statement possesses sense. And, Vic, and by sense, we mean in Wittgenstein's understanding of what makes what is sense and nonsense. And it's true, uh, and that it is true, making it an impossible task. In other words, you can't, based on Wittgenstein's model, argue for inerrancy of Scripture because the very word inerrancy is meaningless. It is nonsense, neither true or false. So that's his first work. And so he, again, so he writes this, 1920, come out, 
He wrote it in 1921, published 1922. I think he actually did a small revision on it. And then the other one in 1953. This one has to do with rationalistic thinking. This is more pragmatic thinking. Here he deconstructs language. Here he's trying to understand language. Here he criticizes his own mentor, Bertrand Russell. Here he goes back further. He's, he's criticizing Augustine and Descartes. His main topics here are language and picture theory and ethics, although he says you can't argue for ethics. Um, and then here you have the language game, private languages, family resemblance, and rules. This is where I think it gets more interesting. The Tractatus, you can get really bogged down into it. But this one really, I think, helps us understand some things. But we have to be careful about applying it uh, because it can be used um, to undermine the idea of the inerrancy of Scripture or the need for the inerrancy of Scripture. So let me try to, to break this down. Wittgenstein began working on the theory of language games, which was published after his death. I think he knew, uh, in a way, what the reaction of people would be to it um, because he knew he was refuting some of his earlier um, positions in, um, in the first one because he said you can't talk about that which is metaphysical and all of this. He changes here on that. He says, you know, I think I was wrong. Maybe he's become more reflective. He died fairly young. He died of prostate cancer. Um, so it's a response to criticism regarding the picture theory of meaning as self-refuting, which I already mentioned. Many people believed his Picture theory itself became self-refuting because uh, in reading his own, uh, the Tractatus, you're going to be engaging in essentially, um, you're not engaging objects in relation to one another as much as you're dealing with ideas, some of which could be classified as metaphysical or ethical in nature. And so he's trying to respond to that as well. Uh, how does one empirically verify the proposition a statement is meaningful if and only if it is empirically verifiable. A statement is meaningful. And this is where he's coming down. He, as he's gotten a little older, realizes meaning for a person's life, meaning, the word meaning can mean two different things, right? Meaning, meaning as a definition, right? What's the meaning of that word? Meaning as in, it's significant to me. It means something to me. And so I think he begins to shift as he realizes um, propositions that didn't fit under his early definitions can be meaningful in a specific context, what he calls game. And we'll talk about that in a moment. He defined language, a language game, as a complete way of doing some activity, including verbal and nonverbal behavior. Importantly, every language game is dependent, is independent of other language games. So an example that I heard from one of the videos is if I were to say, um, you, cannot, you cannot carry the ball in your hands. I mean, that almost sounds like a, like a fact, right? A, uh, a proposition. You cannot carry the ball in your hands. But does that mean anything? You cannot carry the ball in your hands. Um, what are we talking about, right? So you have to understand the game you're playing when you say that. So if we say, well, in football, you cannot carry the ball in your hands. Does that still, does that answer it? Well, are we talking about American football, or are we talking about what the rest of the world calls football? What Americans call soccer, right? And in soccer, or football, you cannot carry the ball in your hand. In American football, yeah, you, you always carry the ball in your hand. So what he's saying is how we use words, uh, the meaning is found within the family or within the game that you're playing. So... That's where the word finds meaning. So it's not about simple propositions. We could say, you cannot carry the ball in football, but it would depend upon what kind of football, what game you're playing. And so he uses this kind of idea when we talk about games being like theology is a game, history is a game, science is a game. So how we use words and the meaning of these words 
is found in the game that we're playing. All right. And even within Christianity, we can think in terms of, uh, for example, the way Mormons refer to Jesus Christ is quite different from the way Protestants refer to Jesus Christ and who Jesus Christ is ultimately in terms of eternality or something like that. Um, even the way Mormons might use the word uh, justification becomes quite, so you're using the same words, but you guess what? You're playing different games. And sometimes when you're talking with someone from another religion, you think you're talking about the same thing, but you're playing two different games. And so he says in terms of the Bible, it doesn't have to be inerrant as long as you're playing the religious game. And he doesn't mean that in a, in a pejorative term. It's just the way he described it. Um, so when you're, when you're playing the religious game and you're studying the Bible, uh, it has meaning. It has meaning for you. And you could think maybe back to some of the other people like, um, like even Karl Barth, you know. The Word is, becomes the Word of God as you read it and as God reveals himself to you. But uh, so he's saying within the religious game, these things make sense. So when you start trying to apply science games to religious texts, then you have a problem. Uh, you, you don't have meaning. So we're trying to say in religious texts, you're playing the religious game and these words make, make absolute sense because we're talking about scripture. We're talking about God. We're talking about miracles. And that's the way we're using the language. But then when someone else comes along who's not a Christian, who's not particularly religious, and then they start wanting to use the science game uh, in reference to what should be a language, a game for religion, then you have problems and you, you lose meaning. The meaning is lost in those situations. So there's a distinction being drawn between truth and fact. True meaning can be found within a language game. And... Um, in certain language games, truths and facts are equivocated. So what well, he would probably argue, he wasn't, he read, uh, I forget if, he read somebody's, when he was in the war, he read somebody's version of the Gospels. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, it was a liberal theologian, a liberal German theologian. And so that was really his perspective on, on all of scripture was based upon, and I can't remember if it was, and the guy's name escapes me, but it was a liberal philosopher, actually, that wrote his version of the gospel. So he takes the gospels and he rewrites them in his own philosophical understanding. And that's what Wittgenstein was exposed to. Um, but in certain language games, truth and facts are equivocated. So it, it doesn't have to be fact to be true. So um, one definition of truth is that which corresponds to reality. And uh, what Victor Stein would say is in the religion game, it doesn't have to correspond with reality because we're talking about religion. We're not necessarily talking about empirically provable facts. We're talking about an experience based upon a sacred text. And uh, so you kind of get, it takes you down the road to where you don't have to argue for infallibility or inerrancy of scripture at all. In fact, he would probably argue, he would argue that it's, it's pointless to even try to talk about the inerrancy of Scripture. Just stick with your game and, uh, and stay there. So this allows religious propositions to be meaningful, but does not permit that they attest to the truth. So to argue that they, they are historically true is meaningless because history is a different game. To argue that they're scientifically true is meaningless because that's a different game. We're talking about religion. And religion has to do with ultimate, uh, well, well, with our, with truth as it relates to our concept of, of otherness, of, of the supreme, of something beyond us that gives our life a sense of spiritual meaning. And he had time to reflect upon that as he was, as he was dying. He ended up living in his, um, in his doctor's home for the last couple of years of his life, his doctor and his wife and the doctor's wife. And, uh, she was talking about her husband told him, we're going to have a guest staying with us for a while, but don't, don't interact with him. <laughs> and she said she tried to be pleasant to him. And, and uh, I don't know, she asked him a question and he kind of threw it back at her in this, you know, typical philosophical kind of language, which seems kind of contrary to his claim to be letting the fly out of the jar. But, and she realized then that 
she wasn't going to try to have long conversations with this guy. So Wittgenstein's picture theory of language and theory of language games render religious claims highly subjective. So here's where you get into, sub, you've heard of the concept subjective truth, right? That's true for you. In fact, uh, in the office this week with Peter Shirakov, you know, Peter has a, has a perspective of Christianity that comes out of his, of his, he's a Messianic Jew. So he's Jewish, but he's a believer. He believes in Jesus Christ. But his concept of Christianity is shaped by that, by that experience, by his understanding of Christ and Scripture. And it's pretty much evangelical, but there are points of divergence. And so I'd explain to him and talk to him about Ludwig's concepts of game theory. And so when Peter was saying something that was kind of different from the way I understood it, I said, well, that's your game. <laughs> I'm playing a different game. So in your game, that makes sense. In my game, not so much. Uh, so you, of course you can start dividing these games down, can't you? Uh, Messianic Christianity, Protestant Christianity, Pentecostal Christianity. In your game, that works. In my game, not so much. So that's the problem with this, is you end up with what's called subjective reality. Because we start saying, well, we're just playing different games. And in this game, that makes sense. But in that game, it doesn't. It's okay for you to believe that because that's your game. I don't have to believe that. That's not my game. And so this is really, I think, one of the main impacts of Wittgenstein. You know, I have this old complicated chapter on this, but really it comes down to this is really the main thing that affected theology, this relativistic view of truth and, and religion and, uh, and trying to say that there's no ultimate truth that's true for you, but it's not necessarily true for me because we're playing different games. And so um, let's take a short break. I know, let your brains decompress for a moment, and uh, we'll get back together in 10 minutes, 10 minutes after 2. Okay, thank you, sir. Yes.